Again, my name is Marty Rosenberg. I'm an energy journalist. I started out in journalism right after leaving Reed, uh, working for the Portland Scribe. Some of you may remember that. Um, then I wrote an a, um, an article for the Oregonian um, as a freelance piece on the launch of Greenpeace when they were sending off a uh, flotilla of ships to harass Russian whalers off of uh, the coast of Vancouver. After that, I was off to the races. Um, and I joined newspapers in Oregon where I came across briefly Nick Kristoff. We worked together in Salem very early in our career. And then I moved on to Kansas City and Nick moved on to the New York Times. He's been a columnist with the Times since 2001. He grew up on a farm in Oregon and graduated from Harvard where he and then became a Rhodes Scholar. He's won two Pulitzer Prizes. He's been described as the moral conscience and the Indiana Jones of journalism. And Bill Clinton said this, um, he feels a personal debt to Nick for his coverage of what it means to fight glo global poverty. Tom, I remember from my days of read, uh, he was a, a active in journalism on campus. He graduated in 72, became a journalist and a lawyer and worked for the Vancouver Columbian and, and Oregonian. He wrote pieces for them and joined the staff of the uh, Greenville, Tennessee Daily Sun, and the Kentucky Post and the Cincinnati Post. He obtained a law degree and has been most lately on the editorial board, the Connecticut Law Tribune. Let's jump right in, Nick. And uh, I learned in preparing for this uh, that your father attended Reed and graduated from Reed uh, in the 50s. And uh, tell us the backstory of how he, how an immigrant from Eastern Europe establishing himself in the United States discovers and then winds up on the Reed College campus. It's a pretty amazing uh, story. Um, so, my uh, my dad's family were um, they were living in what is now kind of southwest Ukraine uh, when he was growing up. It was Romania, and the family was ethnically Armenian. Um, They've been Polonized along the way, so mostly spoke Polish. And so, when you ask my ask my dad where he was from, he would say Romania. When you ask my uncle, he would say Poland. When you ask my aunt, she would say Armenia. Uh, when my uncle would call, they would speak Polish to each other. When my aunt would call, they would speak Romanian. I mean, they were a very confused family. And um, then they had, uh, during World War II, the uh, family uh, was part of a spy ring that was uh, spying on the Nazis in Poland. Uh, they had some family members executed by the Nazis, some by the communists. Uh, my dad uh, fled after the war uh, to Yugoslavia uh, and was then in a concentration camp, um, finally made his way to France, but thought that a, um, a refugee, uh, you know, would never be fully accepted in a French society. And it just so happened there was a young woman from uh, Portland working in Paris as part of the Marshall Plan. She met my dad. She um, she kind of liked them, and she convinced her parents and the First Presbyterian Church in Portland to sponsor his way to come to the U.S. Uh, he didn't speak any English, but uh, and the church had to pay his transport. They had to provide him with a job for a year, so he showed up in Portland, um, took a job at a logging camp for a year to learn English, and he knew nothing about American universities, but uh, the the sponsor. Uh, really recommended that he go to Reed, said, you know, this is the best uh, university in Oregon. And he, um, so he took that advice and applied to Reed. And uh, Frank Monk, whom some of you may remember as a professor in the political science department, um, was a huge supporter of my dad. And uh, he, you know, Frank was a, a Czech refugee, my dad from you know a little further east um and so they hit it off very well and um and uh my, my dad was enormously beholden to frank 
So perhaps the hardest question I'm going to ask you is why did you go to Harvard and not read? Um, you know, I um, I wanted to kind of go some to test myself, build new muscles, go far away. And um, I I never been to the Harvard campus before um, and applied kind of on a lark, <laughs> then was admitted, didn't really know what to do next, but uh, but decided I I should go. So what we're going to discuss for the next hour or so is the, the fate of newspapers and the fate of liberal arts college and studies and uh, how they may be linked. And I'd like to jump off by asking both of you, start with you, Nick, if you were go, going to college now versus when you went in, I believe, 1978, how would you think that world would be different? What ways would it be different? Um, I mean, I, I, I would certainly be different. There are things that I would do differently. I, I majored in political science. I think in retrospect, I'd major in economics uh, because I think that Economics provides a great toolkit through which to look at all kinds of different policies. Um, but I also think that at the end of the day, you know, in the at the end of the 1970s, I got far more out of the community and the school newspaper uh, than out of classes themselves. And I suspect there's a lot of commonality today uh, that most students, those who do not become academics, probably get as much out of out of the larger community and extracurriculars as they do out of the formal classroom uh, instruction. Tom, welcome. And uh, why don't you jump in and, and tell us what you think going to college today as a freshman would, would be like compared to your experience? Well, I think that uh, considerations like uh, college debt, tuition costs, and, and actually what you're going to do for a living would, be, uh, would loom much larger. Uh, at the time that I went, uh, the Vietnam War was going on. I, I think I was 1A. I was struggling with ideas of whether, if I, if I were drafted, uh, whether I would go rather than be a conscientious ob objector. Uh, I'd gone to Quaker schools, and almost everybody in my class would apply to be a CO, but there's a kind of an uh, special easy out that peace churches get so that someone from the inner city goes and takes your place. So, so they, in some ways, the most courageous thing would be to actually go to war and not fight or to, to work against it from within. I didn't think I would have the courage to do that. I, as my senior two week project I went to a cabin in the woods and read War and Peace cover to cover and on civil dis disobedience. And uh, ultimately, I got a high lottery number. <laughs> but uh, the, the uh, idea of a liberal arts education was something that I did not feel I was uh, going to be in charge of. Uh, we had a Humanities 110 crisis when I was there, and uh, I did a paper about what Aristotle would have thought of the Humanities 110 crisis, in which the students were presuming to know better what they should be taught than the professors. So <laughs> let, let me jump in, Tom, Tom, and ask you first, when did you realize you wanted to be a journalist, and how I'm going to ask you both, how did going to a really rigorous liberal arts school where there was a premium on the quality of the education affect you in that decision? Me first? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'd been involved with high school newspapers, uh, literary magazine. When, my, when I came to read, I was, I got the, uh, unusual job of editing the, the Griffin. Oh, so I basically was involved in photography, layout, writing, every aspect of the presentation. And it, I enjoyed almost every aspect equally. But uh, I think that I really was brought up short when I realized that upon graduation, I was not qualified 
in the eyes of the world to be a journalist, which is one of the few professions where you don't get a license, thanks to, to the First Amendment. And I went to Portland State and took a few journalism courses and uh, interned at, at other places. Nick, you were editor of your high school, Yamhill High School newspaper. When did it dawn on you, you wanted to be a, a journalist and how did college, a liberal arts college help you on that path? Well, the crucial educational institution uh, for, in terms of me becoming a journalist was uh, Yamhill grade school. Uh, <laughs> because in the eighth grade, a bunch of students decided that they wanted to have a school newspaper and they held an organizational meeting. Uh, I was not particularly thinking of journalism, I didn't go. But the students who did go, none of them wanted the burden of being the editor. So they chose me as editor in absentia. And my journalism career was born. And I really enjoyed it. And then in high school, um, I know I continued that. I worked for the newspaper in McMinnville, the News Register, after school. And the idea that I was being paid uh, 25 cents a column inch to go talk to interesting people and, and craft articles, I... I you know, I couldn't believe it. Uh, and so uh, then in college, I worked on the, on the school paper, on the Crimson. Um, I don't think, frankly, that either Harvard or then I studied law at Oxford, I don't think either really shaped uh, my journalism career that much, except that I was initially in some danger of becoming a lawyer um, when I studied law and studying property law kind of pointed me more toward journalism. So Nick, you, you've, uh, I'm not sure how long it's run, but you have a program where you have taken young college students or recent graduates to parts of the world. You've been to 150 countries that they may not have got, known much about it and educated them. What do you find, how do you, today's college student that accompanies you, are they as motivated as your generation of college students? Are they different? Um, what, what's been your experience of, of who applies and, and what they do with the knowledge game, they gain? So I have a lot of admiration for young people today. And obviously it's an incredibly diverse set as it was for our generation, but in general, uh, I'd say that there are an awful lot of young people who are, you know, deeply committed to making the world a better place. Uh, and I think that they are somewhat less uh, ideological and perhaps somewhat more pragmatic than, uh, than previous generations. And, you know, I think that in some ways is uh, a good thing. I think they're, you know, when I take them on these trips and they're trying to figure out how do you get more kids in school uh, in the developing world? Or how do you stop a conflict, whatever the problem may be? How do you reduce malnutrition? Then they tend to be, um, you know, relentlessly empirical and eager to, to look at research and to talk to people on the ground and, and willing to change minds. Uh, the program, this win a trip program, uh, it started out because I was in 2004, 2005, I was trying to get more attention to Darfur. And I was just very frustrated that, you know, it was difficult to get the world's attention. And I thought, well, if I take a student with, if I have a contest to take a student with me to Darfur, the student writes about it as well, that will, uh, you know, amplify the message. And so I proposed this in-house at the New York Times and the Times lawyer said, so you want to take a student to a war zone. Uh, and so I, I recalibrated it as a uh, as a general win a trip contest to take a student to the developing world and then took them around the fringes that first time of, uh, of Darfur. And um, so the, the student that accompanied you, what is she or he doing today? Um, so the, the, my, my first winner uh, has been uh, writing for the New Yorker now and has a book published. I worked for the Oregonian for a while afterward. Um, the second winner uh, is uh, Lena Wen, who you see on CNN all the time as a, as a health analyst. Um, and then uh, uh, another is working at the New York Times, Mitch Smith. They've, they've done very, very well for themselves. Uh, and the 
I mean, the, the challenge has been, you know, there are all these folks applying with just extraordinary backgrounds and uh, picking a winner has been pretty difficult. Tom, uh, uh, given your, your work with the law review and monitoring legal trends, how do you assess the problem of free speech on the U.S. campus today? Well, it's, uh, it's distressing to me that uh, people are disinviting speakers, that ideas have become uh, a, a, a something to reject before they're, they're heard. It just seems like the opposite of what uh, both the First Amendment and a liberal arts education is all about that if you uh, if you have uh, if you're rejecting hearing about it ahead of time that that can't be the right attitude to go into education. There was a book that came out um, 13 years ago this month called The Closing of the American Mind by Alan Bloom. Uh, in which he posits that higher education has failed democracy and impoverished the souls of today's students. Uh, Nick, what do you think of that indictment? And is it, how, is it, how does the uh, record look today? So, I mean, in general, I think there's no doubt that higher education, you know, in fact, opens minds uh, and points them in new directions. But like Tom, I do think that there uh, is a problem of uh, discouraging, you know, to the extent that campuses tend to be very liberal. I do think that there is a problem with um, discouraging conservatives from visiting campuses. Um, I do think that, especially that to some extent, there is some danger that we liberals will embrace all kinds of diversity except for ideological diversity, which is one of the most important. Um, so I, you know, I, 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 I think that higher education is, you know, a huge public good for the country. You look at the impact on voting patterns, uh, on attitudes towards bias of all kinds, and it's a huge gift, not only to those who get that education, but to the country as a whole. But, you know, is there a problem with um, it creating bias on campuses? Yeah, I think there is. Let's, let's turn for right now to the uh, faded newspapers where circulation currently or in recent years has fallen to about 1940 levels when the population of the United States was 40% of, of what it is today. Um, and the number of daily newspapers have, has declined markedly over 26% compared to when Tom, you and I were going to read. Um, of course, there's the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post but out in the hinterlands in Kansas City, where I sit, or in Portland, um, the quality and the resources of journalism has gone down markedly. Tom, as somebody that's labored in regional newspapers, how do you see it? And Nick, as somebody at the New York Times, how do you view that problem? Tom? Well, my, my first paper was this Greenville Sun in Upper East Tennessee, which we were right next to the federal court building and that probably had more moonshiner cases from the IRS than anywhere else. I talked to the publisher, the recently ex-publisher of that paper, Greg Jones yesterday. Uh, he's one of three brothers. His oldest brother is Alex Jones, who is not the bad Alex Jones. He <laughs> is a Harvard uh, journalism scholar who gave an award to Nicholas Kristof. Uh, and uh, Greg's assessment was that newspapers have, especially regional local newspapers like that, have never been needed more or been under more pressure. But at the same time, uh, I think that circulation was 10,000 at the Greenville Sun when I was there. 15,000 and it's 10,000 now. It hasn't fallen off a cliff. There's a, uh, Greg's papers, family owned about 14 different papers and uh, some are doing well, some are not doing well. Part, part of it has to do with the, uh, the expectations of the owners. In, 
in Hartford in Connecticut, where I lived for 25 years or so, uh, the Hartford Current is homeless. It's the oldest continuously published newspaper in America. Uh, it's owned by a hedge fund now that is notorious for uh, bleeding newspapers to death. And uh, it, that's, that's very distressing. But at the same time, there are, there are a few major papers that have been bought by billionaires and they are winning Pulitzer Prizes and adding to their staff, certainly not, uh, not dying on the vine by any means. So it's, if we could get to a point, and, and the publications that are essentially funded by foundations or have an, an alternative source of, uh, of income or like the Guardian are quite strong in their reporting. Uh, I think that the real crisis is in small town regional papers. And uh, I think that's very dangerous. I think that the, there's nobody looking at the local government for one thing. Nick, uh, the New York Times has migrated to a business model that's allowing it to, to expand and show some muscle. Um, and it's doing fairly well in the digital world. Does it see any, do you hear any talk back in the, in the home office about it, helping these small regional newspapers or injecting life to coverage of local issues around the country? So um, I think there is a feeling that there wasn't 10 years ago, that now there is a good business model for the New York Times, for the Washington Post, for the Wall Street Journal, for a few national organizations. Uh, but that business model has not emerged for the Oregonian or for you know smaller papers uh, around the country. And I completely share with Tom this concern about what's going to happen. At the end of the day, I don't really think that the New York Times can fill that gap. I mean, I'm delighted when I see people in Portland or McMinnville uh, subscribe to the Times, and you know, I hope more do, but we're not going to cover the Yamhill County uh, courthouse the way the McMinnville News Register uh, historically has. And when these newspapers uh, go under around the country, it means there's a loss of accountability. Um, there's a loss of the social fabric. In, in McMinnville, the, I'm on the family farm right now, so it's kind of the closest town. And you know the social fabric has derived in large part from the news register in the one hand and uh, from Linfield College on the other. And both institutions are somewhat endangered. Uh, it, and that is, we're seeing that all across the country. I think this is a real challenge for a democracy. And, you know, historically, I would never have endorsed this, but now I'm beginning to think of ways in which uh, government should support and keep alive some community newspapers around the country in the way that it supports arts or supports the sciences, things that don't have a, can't pay for themselves, but are really important for the country as a whole. So the three of us got into journalism around the time that, uh, Robert Redford and Dustin Hoffman were glamorizing the profession and all the president's men. So I'm gonna ask you, Nick, a pointed question and Tom, you'll, you'll follow it up with your answer. Do you think a Donald Trump could have been elected president if newspapers in the last five years were where they were in the seventies? And do you think the threat to voting rights now underway in this country would have happened back in the seventies when newspapers had a lot of more muscle in their communities. Yeah, I mean, I would disagree with the premise of that in that I do think that national newspaper scrutiny and national news organization scrutiny is actually more robust today than it was in the 1970s. So, you know, the New York Times has far more people now, the Washington Post has far more people now than it did in the 1970s. You have organizations like Politico, uh, ProPublica, uh, et cetera. So I think at the national level, there's actually um, more robust scrutiny than there historically was and a continued adversarial relationship to the White House, et cetera. But um, what has changed is you know, that you don't have that scrutiny in state capitals and in local communities, and that there's also a 
you know, uh, I'd say a considerably greater distrust for news organizations so that when people were publishing articles about uh, President Trump or reports about President Trump, then there was an instinctive uh, dismissal of it in a way that was not true uh, when we had, you know, three networks and one of them would report on, uh, on, on what Nixon had said. Tom? Well, the... 70s didn't have reality TV or 24 hour news cycles on cable TV. And I think that that electronic side of news was a perfect storm for Trump to take advantage of. He was given, he created artificial controversy whenever he could. And it was free uh, for the, the the broadcast networks and uh, the ca cable TV stations. So in, in a sense, they, the print media couldn't fight back or couldn't compete with that. And there was a, just a huge enamored crowd that, that loved the reality TV star. I can't what, imagine what, that. That couldn't have happened in the 70s. What about the, the, uh, the practical effect of a young Tom Sheffy going to read this fall or a young Nick Kristoff heading to Harvard next in this fall, won't have the grassroots journalism to try out at a McMinnville newspaper or Oregonian or, or a Vancouver Sun over in Vancouver newspaper, Columbia. Um, there's less opportunities, there's less chance for people like the three of us to come along. Would you agree with that, Tom? Well, it sounds like the and the flip side in the law is the the vanishing trial. Nobody nobody uh, can cut their teeth as a trial lawyer anymore because even before COVID, they were very rare. But I think that uh, I think that there are a lot of if a person wants to write, there are places to write, and uh, I think. It's very encouraging that there are opportunities, there are foundations that sponsor people to get their feet wet. And certainly the small newspapers need young reporters. Uh, I think that it has to be a, a labor of love. It, it's never been a, 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 a big dollar profession, but uh, I, I'd, I'd like to see people go into journalism, but even the people that go into journalism school can't have never been, all been able to get jobs. So, Nick, it is closing. Yeah. Nick, what do you feel? You think young aspiring journalists have the opportunities we had, or is it a tougher road? I think it's a tougher road, but probably only marginally, uh, in that they're. Um, you know, the, there are fewer jobs in community newspapers around the country. On the other hand, there has been, you know, the arrival of Politico, of BuzzFeed, of, um, well, Bloomberg is this, you know, huge monster that employs more journalists perhaps than any other organization in the U.S. Um, so there have been new alternatives that have arisen as the old ones have faded away. Um, you know, I do think, though, that financially, it's uh, kind of a different picture in that now it's sort of expected that people will go to journalism school. And that's really expensive. And if you have to calculate that you're going to go to journalism school, and then may or may not get a journalism job after that, and if you do, it will be paid exceptionally poorly. Um, you know, that's, that's a real uh, factor, I think, in people's calculations. And I fear that that may affect who we can attract to journalism. And also just the, you know, the, the field is to some degree held in, in a certain amount of disrepute. Uh, and, you know, you see that in polls. Tom, what's the uh, most important piece of journalism you did? That I did? Yeah. Um, I covered the Beverly Hills Supper Club fire. That was one of the three Pulitzer nominees that, that we were involved in. I was the first reporter there and the Kentucky Post, which was just a mile from downtown Cincinnati, uh, was 
it had that magical thing of a, a you know a huge national event occurring in your backyard and my editor was a pulitzer prize winner himself uh and uh we actually lost that one to uh a louisville courier journal reporter who was uh living in my house <laughs> uh, uh and and his team they they put together a much better package for one thing uh in some senses i think um the work that i did on the west thompson merger and the threat to law of having legal citations become private property is low low interest but it might be the the fact that that we didn't have our national system of of citation become a commercial product, I think, makes made the law more accessible. And that Nick, boiled down to one vote. Nick, you, COVID has gotten you back to Oregon, um, and you're, I believe, sitting in Yamhill right now. Um, and you've written a book about people you grew up with in, around that area. Um, talk about what, I mean, we talked about, you mentioned the New York Times is not in a cover of Yamhill, yet you have quite eloquently. I'll talk about that story of what's happening in rural America and rural Oregon. You know, it's pretty heartbreaking. Um, uh, you know, I was traveling around the world covering humanitarian crises and I'd come back to the farm here and I saw a humanitarian crisis unfolding here. I'm, I'm, I've, I'm still close to high school friends, the people on the old number six school bus with me. And uh, at this point, about a third of the kids on my old number six school bus have died from uh, drugs, alcohol, and suicide. Uh, they lost jobs, they self-medicated, they got criminal records that made them less employable, less marriageable. We were uh, very proud of our you know, rural values and our strong social fabric. And those um, upended incredibly quickly. Uh, those disintegrated when those uh, good union jobs went away in places like this. And uh, watching that unravel in a community you care deeply about and seeing, um, you know, the, the, I mean, the, the family just down the road uh, who got on the school bus right after me each day, there were five kids. Um, the oldest, Farland, who was my grade, lost his job and uh, used, abused meth and, uh, and alcohol and died of uh, liver failure as a result. His next brother, Zelan, died in a house fire when he was passed out drunk. His sister, Regina, died of hepatitis from IV drug use. His brother, Nathan, blew himself up cooking meth. His uh, brother, Keelan, I uh, lost a job at the beginning of the pandemic a year ago and died of a heroin overdose in March of last year. And, you know, five kids uh, of enormous talent, um, all dying one after the other. Uh, their mom is still alive, walks up the hill to visit their graves every, every day. And, you know, it's like something that I covered in South Sudan or something, but it's happening here in Yam Hill and it's heartbreaking. And it's, it's why I'm here right now. I'm trying to figure out how I can use my toolkit to try to highlight the problems and the solutions, uh, not just for Yam Hill, but for the Yam Hills all over the country. Are people locally reading the book and talking to you about it? Yeah, we were... Um, we were really quite concerned about how people in the community would react to the book because it's kind of, you know, airing dirty laundry. And um, in fact, and also the, I mean, the people here tend to be quite conservative, tend to be uh, quite pro-Trump and, you know, my policy solutions are very different from theirs, but there's a deep recognition here that things went profoundly wrong. And at the end of the day, I don't think people in communities like this, you know, they don't want your sympathy. What they want is respect and understanding. And I think they feel that the book gave them uh, that sense of respect and that we listen to them. Um, it helps that I'm a local boy, that I wasn't an outsider 
highlighting the problems, but that you know everybody knows I care about the community as much as they do, uh, even if they think I'm completely wrong in, in my solutions. Um, and um, people are, um, you know, there's a just degree of, I mean, heartbreak and it's, it's the, the pandemic, you know, Marty in many ways made it worse. And there were a lot of people who have been able to stay off drugs for a while because of support groups. And then those support group, in-person support groups collapsed. And so they, they didn't have that support. And meanwhile, they weren't having to provide uh, urine samples. Uh, uh, so there was no accountability. And then it was a lot easier to reach for heroin or reach for meth. And um, so I've seen some dear friends relapse. Uh, and I think, you know, that likewise has happened around the country. We had 91,000 overdose deaths in the U.S. Uh, in the 12 months ending in October, a new record. What are your thoughts of where you want to take your writing on that problem in the future? You know, I, I I don't know exactly. I'm uh, trying to do more to highlight the issues. I think that we, you know, this tends to be a working class problem, and we in the media have not been very good at highlighting working class issues of, you know, whether it's uh, white, black, or brown. Um, and I, I spent a lot of time in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, those were important stories. If anything, they should have been covered more, not less. But every two weeks in the US, we lose more Americans from these deaths of despair, from drugs, alcohol, and suicide than we lost in 20 years of war in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I don't think we've covered that adequately. I don't think we've conveyed um, the impact that, that has on families, especially on kids the degree to which it's transmitted generation to generation, the degree to which we have policies that have failed to respond adequately. Only 20% of Americans with substance abuse problems get treatment. Um, and um, you know we have a narrative that it's all about personal responsibility that I think is profoundly flawed and is about pointing fingers rather than about offering helping hands. Um, and I should say also that I think there's a, I mean, you know, that tends to be the conservative narrative that it's all about personal responsibility, bad choices. And I think that's completely unhelpful. I'm afraid that there's also sometimes a liberal narrative about rural whites who are suffering this way that, oh, you know, those are Trump voters. They they made their bed, let them lie in it. And uh, that they, you know, they 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 chose these outcomes and a lack, lack of, of empathy for them uh, because they tend to be very right wing. And, you know, I think at all ends, we. Um, that kind of harsh condemnation is unhelpful and a little more empathy uh, would be much more useful. I'm going to turn to some of the questions we're getting from people listening in. Um, Frankie Forte, who serves on the committee that helped form um, this, this reunion week uh, activities asks, I'm concerned that children do not read newspapers, do not read enough books. What can we do about this? Nick, do you have any ideas? Um, I, uh, you know, I, I worry about this in the case of, of Oregon. I think our school system has been deteriorating. Um, and uh, I, you know, you see that in fourth grade math scores are ninth from the bottom uh, uh, in the NAEP results. Uh, reading are somewhat better, but I think there has to be a real push and, and we have, organizations like reading partners like reach out and read there you know there are literacy organizations that do a really good job of getting kids to uh to improve their reading um there are programs like nurse family partnership that reach out to uh, kids in early childhood and uh, promote uh reading but um we've uh, you know we have the toolkit but we haven't invested in in those kids who most need it tom any thoughts Oh, on a similar vein, uh, I'm active with the Connecticut Council on Freedom of Information, and uh, we've set up teams of lawyers and journalists to go into schools to, to teach about the uh, Bill of Rights and the First Amendment specifically. And I sort of agree with Nicholas that, that there's a there's a, a 
falling down on, on the teacher level, I don't think that there's really been much enthusiasm from social studies teachers or, or people who would be in the position to encourage involvement with, with uh, social, governmental, civic uh, matters, uh, teaching students and, and making that topic come alive. And that's that's very dangerous if 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 we have the chief executive saying that the the media is the enemy of the people. Marianne Mulkey uh, asks, and I'll, I'll ask you this question first, Tom. How much truth do you find in the elitist snob indictment of liberal arts colleges and media outlets? I'm not sure I heard every word, but I'll. I, I think the indictment I that the media and liberal arts colleges are elitist. How do you respond to that? Well, I've, I've been thinking a lot about this idea that you know the founding fathers had that, that the sovereign in this country is the people, and who who is the people? What is the people? And if people with good educations extract themselves from that or don't try to speak at a level that can be understood by people with less education, the people suffers. It's, it's bifurcated. It's a snake cut up in pieces. The head isn't neutrifying the rest of the body, if you will. It, that, uh, and I think that this country needs to have both coasts speak to the center or whatever, that, that we have to not put such a premium on speaking an elite language, whether it's in the professions or in academe and subtracting our best thinkers from the populace or, or somehow making, making ordinary people feel that pointy headed intellectuals are, uh, something to be feared and despised. Nick, what do you think of, of this division of the elite versus the anti elite? I, um, I mean, I think that there is a real issue here. Michael Sandel wrote a, I think, a very good book, The Tyranny of Merit, in which he, you know, he talked about this. And I, I you know, I, I do think that there tends to be a certain uh, condescension toward uh, uh, less educated, people that has been amplified by the political polarization in the country as education becomes a marker of who one votes for. Um, and I think, you know, I, I think universities are extraordinary public goods, but often they are vehicles to transmit advantage from one generation to the next at a number of, uh, of top institutions. 60% uh, of the student body comes from the top 1%, 60%, you know, that's, uh, I think that's really hard to justify. And then when, when academic institutions uh, provide a benefit in admissions to legacy, that is giving help to people who will, to kids who already have every advantage over kids who have fewer advantages. And um, so I think, you know, the university community needs to try to figure out how to broaden that kind of opportunity. I, I think we should move away from legacy preferences and admissions, uh, donor preferences, uh, you know, faculty children preferences, all these things. Um, and I think it would be helpful if we could figure out more ways to mix people up from different, you know, social classes and, uh, you know, some kind of a year of national service voluntary, because I don't think a mandatory one would ever get very far, but I think, you know, might be helpful in that regard. So let me ask you, Nick, first, as I, Tom, to what extent do you see the Biden administration effort to try to inject funding into families and the middle class and perhaps the lower middle class, possibly uh, having some effect? That's part A and part B. To what extent coming out of COVID are we going to see our social fabric change and evolve in different ways? It's a two-part question, really. Do you want me to start or who did you yeah, want to Yeah, please. Oh, okay. Um, so um, um, 
the uh, how you know the social fabric will change. Um, uh, I think it'll. Um, you know, I think we're seeing the importance of care, and the women in particular were, uh, you know, were very badly hit in their ability to work. Um, uh, and I hope that that will amplify the uh, underscore the need for you know daycare programs, for example, in pre-K, which just about every other advanced country has. I do think that, um, you know, my view is that the U.S. basically took a wrong path over about the last 50 years and that we underinvested in human capital in this country, in social programs, and that you see President Biden systematically kind of moving to address some of these gaps that other countries have addressed. So, again, pre-K, uh, uh, daycare, uh, uh, child allowances, which he calls refundable tax credits, um, bandwidth for all. Um, I think these would make an enormous difference in opportunity. When I think about, I mentioned the nap kids earlier, the five nap kids, you know, they were in a really violent um, house where their dad was beating up their mom and beating them up every day. Uh, it was a household where the kids learned how to fix carburetors, but not how to read. And I think that if there had been early childhood programs, uh, if there had been a social worker who was trying to intervene to reduce that childhood trauma, um, maybe their talents might have actually been deployed better. I, uh, Yamhill was completely transformed in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s through the New Deal um, electrification, um, the WPA, uh, GI Bill of Rights. And it seems to me that you know, we have a fighting chance now to get some similar version of the New Deal uh, uh, this year and in the next couple of years. Tom, to you, to what extent has the suffering around COVID and uh, the, the shutdown of America and now it's reopening, along with the election of Biden and, and his emphasis on families and family resources, lead you to, uh, to be optimistic? Well, I think that there are a lot of things of value other than checks from the government, although that's important. And I think that one of the, I, I share this idea with Nicholas of the, the terrific things that uh, a, a year of service or a Peace Corps-like initiative on a domestic level could have. I feel that riches are expressed in how many words a child can speak has in his vocabulary at an early age. That might be more valuable than, uh, than uh, dollars. And if we would, as a country, uh, remove some of the, the stigma of people of different generations who are not in the same family, Boy Scouts now are, almost destroyed by uh, the idea that the only reason that a man would help a boy is for, for perverse reasons. Uh, if we could get more interaction between the generations, more sharing, more uh, teaching of very simple things at an early age, give, some, give the mother some help. I mean, childcare is, is uh, is is hard and but early childhood education is really important for nurturing the civic structure that we need as a country. Last question of Mark McLean: Our local paper is still hanging on to its independence, but struggling, especially with its print edition. What can ordinary people do to support local newspapers? Tom. <sighs> Buy a newspaper and read it, and read it in front of your kids. I, I was thinking about all the questions you made me cast back to the 18-year-old town or earlier, and I realized my father had a very hard time making and starting a fire because he couldn't give up a New York Times editorial that he hasn't hadn't read. When my parents shared something like that. They would certainly have wanted to share Nicholas's columns if they'd 
overlapped. It was a model to the children that that this was this was a an important way that people uh, interact and are on the same page literally. And uh, so people enjoying and uh, getting engaged in uh, the printed word is a, is a pretty wonderful thing. Nick, beyond buying a newspaper, what can folks do to support journalism? Um, so, I mean, I've been at the policy level, I've been playing with the idea um, that government should think about subsidies of community newspapers. And I think the way it would be done would be something like the National Science Foundation uh, awarding grants or, uh, you know, an arts council awarding arts grants to local papers. And I, I, I flinch at the idea, um, but I flinch even more at the idea of local papers uh, going out of business around the country. Um, and I'd also say that, you know, philanthropy, I think we have to think about local papers may uh, end up becoming nonprofits, or maybe they have a nonprofit arm that also takes donations from community foundations, or, you know, maybe a local foundation sponsors a reporter. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure what models are gonna arise, but what we have now just is not working. Thank you both. Uh, thanks for everyone for attending this conversation.